reality, captured in user-friendly symbols and processed for understanding. The Idea Channel. Hello, I'm Gary Becker, economist at the University of Chicago. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to discuss my views. During my professional career, I've been primarily interested in trying to understand social behavior, especially in trying to see how far we can understand such behavior under the assumption that participants behave rationally. Now, by rational behavior, I mean that individuals, including families and firms, try to do as best as they can, given the limited resources at their disposal, the competition from others, and their endeavors to anticipate into the uncertain future the consequences of their behavior. Now this concern has taken me into a variety of complex social issues. My first book was on racial discrimination, an attempt to apply economic analysis to understanding uh, lower earnings of blacks and other minorities. I've also considered the issue of crime and punishment, of addictive behavior, of competition among pressure groups, and a number of other subjects. Probably the two subjects that I've spent most time on are the family and human capital. With regard to the family, I've tried to understand why people marry, when they marry, how many children they have, if married, when, if ever, do they divorce, and a number of other dimensions of the institution that is perhaps the oldest and most fundamental in all civilized societies. One of the things that families do is to care for their children, to invest in their children, to teach their children morals, skills, and other forms of behavior. Human capital deals with the acquisition of education, training, health, and other skills by individuals that improves their capacities to earn money, to acquire sk uh, skillful jobs, and to otherwise perform well in uh, modern or less uh, modern societies. Now these interests have been mostly concerned with understanding the functions of societies. However, at the same time, I've also been concerned with trying to evaluate how societies perform, and in particular, the role of governmental activity in different areas. There is a close connection between whether or not we assume that people behave rationally and most people's attitudes about the appropriateness of particular forms of governmental uh, regulations and expenditures. Let me just give a, few, a couple of examples from areas that I have studied. One of the most difficult issues in the crime area is to decide how well we can deter crime with various types of punishments. Take the issue, the very controversial issue of capital punishment. Most people would be in favor, I believe, of capital punishment if they believe that capital punishment greatly reduced the number of murders committed. Similarly, most people would be opposed to punishment if they believe that the deterrent effect of punishment was minimal. So again, the effect of capital punishment on people's behavior, the rationality, so to speak, of their response to the prospects of such punishment is uh, crucial in evaluating uh, these policies. A similar uh, importance to incentives is in current policy toward the use of drugs. If people were convinced the users of drugs entered into the use of drugs rather fully aware of the potential adverse consequences of these drugs, then I believe that most people would be in favor 
of greatly increased legalized access to drugs. On the other hand, if we believe that people who became addicts did so in an irrational response to various stresses or other difficulties in their life, then the case for legalizing drugs would be much weaker. And this is true in many other areas. There is an intimate relation between the rationality or lack of rationality of behavior and the evaluation of various governmental programs. So my interest in understanding society at these points intersects with one interest that I also have in trying to evaluate governmental programs. Well, your <coughs> interests, in, particularly encompassing the family, uh, human behavior relative to marriage, etc., yeah, I, I'll be delighted if you can sort out marriage for us. That's a big one. <laughs> that, but it, it seems to me interesting that you're both an actor and, an, and a, uh, a, a, a very dedicated observer of that. Uh, how do you sort out those two things? Do you, d does your research as an economist uh, affect you in, as, as a player in these various roles? Probably not a great deal, although um, I, wouldn't, I would like to feel it has some effect. I think it's helped me a little bit in trying to get to the heart as best I can of the motives that people have in deciding, for example, if they should marry and if they should divorce and the, the treatment of children and spouses and all these other complicated social issues. Do you ever get into conversations about this with neighbors and friends? Uh, uh, in a sense, at a society level, rather than as a professional thing. Well, very frequently, but sometimes these, uh, these two intersect. Uh, frequently, uh, people who are aware that I've written on these subjects come to me often in, in confidence and ask, well, I'm having so-and-so difficulty in my marriage or something else. What do you think I should do? And Fascinating. <laughs> so, so it's Gary Becker, sociologist, <laughs> economist, and marriage counselor. <laughs> in part. I, I think a very poor marriage counselor. But I get asked that. Um, uh, surprisingly frequently. <laughs> I, that, that leads me into, it seems to me, a dilemma in all of the uh, professions, and that is that you as an economist spend a lot of time on these matters. You, you focus on them, you, you do intensive research, trying to sort out cause and effect, um, yet you're somewhat admitting in your answer there a, a, f a feeling of inadequacy in providing uh, too much advice to others on, on the level of personal day-to-day -day behavior. Uh, well, what about the average citizen then? Do we, do we have any chance at all uh, of understanding these things? Well, I think economics is much more successful at understanding average behavior than at understanding the idiosyncratic behavior of individuals. So while I, would, I do greatly hesitate in giving advice to individuals, I am much more confident uh, in trying to give some advice from the point of view of social policy to uh, the average individual or policies that will affect uh, in, uh, marriages or family size as a whole. Because in the aggregates, many of the uh, special circumstances that dominate individuals' decisions cancel out. And we're left with much more fundamental forces that are operating. And I think this is true in every part of economics, not simply in these difficult areas of the family, but also in understanding what firms do, what consumers do. In, in every dimension of economics, we're much more successful, have much more confidence in dealing with the average person, the aggregate of responses, than each individual response. Turning to uh, Gary Becker's background for a minute, at what point in your life did you, if you would, discover economics? Was there a day in which the light bulb went on and said, ah, economics? Well, it actually came to me surprisingly early as a freshman. I was a freshman at Princeton. I went into Princeton with an interest in mathematics and also an interest in social problems. And I didn't quite know how to bring these two interests together. Fortunately, I was required more or less to take a year's course in economics as a freshman and had a textbook by Paul Samuelson, a very well-known textbook. And I was entranced by the last half of that book where he dealt with what's called price theory, where he combined mathematics and what appeared to be the ability to say things about social 
uh, situation, society. And that, that sold me on economics. My interest was almost killed by a high school course I had in economics, but fortunately it was revived <laughs> it was when revived. I was a freshman. <laughs> hey, and, and you decided at that point, more or less, then, to pursue economics seriously? I decided at that point, I had a crisis when I was a senior, I began to think that economics was sterile and not really dealing with the social problems I was dealing with. Um, and coming to University of Chicago as a graduate student and encountering Milton Friedman, uh, T.W. Schultz, Greg Lewis and some other great economists at Chicago showed me that one could uh, deal with these important social problems and still base it on a rigorous approach to economics. You're uh, a native of Pennsylvania since you were born there. Right. Um, in, in fact, Pottsville, PA is hometown? Pottsville, PA was where I was born. How, how long did you live there? Did you go to high school there? No, we, I only went uh, there for a few years of elementary school and then um, we moved into New York City where my father changed jobs. I went to high school in New York City, James Madison High School. That must have been quite a change. Of course, th you didn't have the comparison. It wasn't as if you'd started high school in Pottsville. And no, right. No, it, I did basically most of my schooling in New York City. Were you aware of the, uh, in, in the days in Pennsylvania, uh, were you aware of the environment, the, the coal mine, the hard coal region, and the, uh, and the uh, if you would, the poverty and the uh, as, uh, problems that existed in the labor markets there? Is that well, I was a young boy at the time. Uh, my father, who was a businessman in Pottsville, and um, we lived in a number of small towns in the New Jersey, Pennsylvania area, he uh, often has told stories about dealing with miners and the poverty and the difficulties that miners face. So I heard many stories about miners, even though uh, uh, many of these I only remember from a later age in my lifetime, but certainly uh, I, my parents, and particularly my father, had to deal with mine as, uh, on a business and personal relation all the time, and it was a difficult situation in that time. Well, I was born in 1930, which wasn't the greatest time in general <laughs> for uh, the economy, so uh, my first 10 years was um, uh, uh, my family, my father did uh, reasonably well, but of course those were difficult times in general. Right. So you have some first-hand uh, knowledge of, of that aspect of society. What were your academic interests in high school? Uh, the sciences, math, uh, math and science. Um, mainly math was my major interest. Uh, you know, at one time I was on both the handball team and the math team. I gave up the handball team to stay on the math team. So you can see I had a pretty strong <laughs> interest in mathematics. Yes. And the second interests were in physics and uh, chemistry. Uh, did you have a childhood hero? Anyone, anything, any person that stands out? I don't remember. I mean, there are a number of people I looked up to a great deal. Key uh, role model then? Well, at one time I wanted to go to West Point, but I gave that up fairly, fairly quickly. And uh, I, of course, my, my father was a businessman, respected a number of prominent businessmen a great deal. And I saw, so that was conveyed to my brother and sisters. So, uh, you know, a number of the well-known businessmen who were either making money or advising presidents like Bernard Baruch and others were considered heroes in our family. Despite the hard life of the coal fields and, and the stories your father told you, uh, did he also touch on the, the culture, the family orientation? I have some friends who, who were raised in that area and they tell me about the closeness of the family and how important the family was. Did you have any of that? Did you touch on that? Well, we had a very close family, and so I experienced it directly within my family. I had three other siblings. Uh, I was the third from the youngest, and um, we interacted a great deal with each other, and we were close to my parents. I always, uh, and well, my father was from the European school, and it was very stern and strict. Uh, we always felt the family was extremely important, and cousins as well as immediate family. And so, yes, I grew up with a great emphasis on the family, and I still feel that, that the family is um, 
even in modern American society, is, is a, just the most important institution for most people. When the chips are down, usually that's who uh, people rely on. And it, is, it, is it that conviction that led you to, to spend so much time on research of the family, or, or was there some other motivation that, that led you in that direction? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's always difficult to find out precisely to why one gets into problems. Uh, I got into the study of racial discrimination when I was a graduate student because I thought I had an idea that I could make some progress in using economics to understand differences in earnings and other treatment of minorities. And similarly, in the marriage, I remember being in a hotel room in New York City once, and I thought I had an idea how to understand a little bit about uh, who got married to each other. That's, that's a very abstruse question. She's yes, far then. removed from economics. But I thought I had some way of getting at that. And I said, well, family is, I knew, of course, the family is, is a fundamental institution. And at that time, I said, well, if you have a couple of ideas about it, maybe you can really carry these and make a little bit of progress in trying to understand this fundamental institution. So I started from that one idea, and it just led me from one thing to the next. And I, I felt all along that since this was so important, if I could make any progress on it, this would be something of a contribution. So that, so to speak, supported me during the dark moments. But I don't think I would have done it unless I felt I had uh, an idea to say, there are so many important problems out there in social science that one just can't make any progress on because you don't have a way of getting at them. Well, did you start with it seems to me you did start with an assumption then that the family was a key role player, a, 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 even, even a fundamental one within society. So therefore, your research is examining that. Does that put you in the position of defending the family in any way against some of the alternatives that are being suggested? Well, yes and no. I think one has to distinguish defending the family in general from defending particular manifestations of family arrangements. Now, in my book on the family, I stress the enormous changes that have occurred in the family since the early 1950s. Probably the most rapid changes that have occurred during any similar period, I think, in recorded history. Many people lament these changes. I don't lament them in the book. I think for the most part these changes were good responses to the different circumstances that people find themselves in in the modern period. The great uh, labor force participation of married women, the small number of children that people have, the welfare state that has reduced the need for people to rely on the family for certain sorts of protection like in old age and the like. So I think those changes were on the whole good changes, good adaptations to new circumstances. At the same time, I stress that the family is still the fundamental institution for most people. They still do more things in the family than they do in the marketplace. They still rely on the, mar on the family for a great deal of help where they have no other access. So the family is still important. It, and therefore, in that sense, I, th I do defend the family. I don't think the family is vanishing. It's changing its forms. And for the most part, as I said, it's changing its forms in efficient adaptations to the circumstances that we're faced with in the eight, 1980s and will be faced with in the 1990s. Touch on family behavior as compared to individual behavior. You treat the family as a unit in, in research, and yet it's really a collection of individual behavior. How do you adjust those two? Or well, it is a unit, but it's also a unit that has some conflicts within it. There are many types of conflicts in the family, some of which I try to treat. For example, a conflict between parents and children. Parents, most parents, are concerned about their children's welfare and uh, are altruistic or love their children. On the other hand, frequently children would like, their, like to get more from their parents than their parents are willing to give them. So that's a basic conflict. A child would like more attention, more money, and all parents know the problems <laughs> faced with children who, whose demands seem to be un, uh, in, unable, unable to be satiated. All right, so that's a conflict. Of course, husbands and wives have conflicts, and some of these conflicts lead to splitting up and a separation and divorce. So while the family is a unit, and in some respects it behaves as if it was a homogeneous unit, 
Yet in many other respects, one has to treat the conflict among members. And I've tried to pay uh, certainly my share of attention to understanding this conflict and seeing uh, the directions the conflict has been leading, particularly uh, during the last 25 years. And when you suggest that it can be predicted that certain uh, events will lead to certain reactions by the family, you're then taking into account the internal interaction that's going to lead to that, that ultimate family action as opposed to individual players? Is that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, if a family takes a, a certain step, let's say uh, decides to spend its money in a particular way, it, it has to solve, before it can do that, the conflicts that may arise among family members. Let me give you a, a very concrete example. Prior to 1970 in the United States, it was not possible very readily to get divorced in almost any state of the United States unless there was mutual consent that both husbands and wives agreed to the divorce. Even then it was sometimes not possible. And yet there were an increasing number of divorces that had occurred even prior to 1970. So husbands and wives had to resolve that conflict. Maybe one wanted the divorce. Let's say typically the husband was more likely to want the divorce than the wife. How did they manage to convince the wife uh, to agree to a divorce in an environment where the husband alone could not obtain the divorce? That conflict had to be resolved. Sometimes it was not resolved and families uh, remain married even though uh, one party wanted the divorce. At other times, however, it, could be, it was resolved. Perhaps the husband gave a bigger alimony or more child support or in some other way, so to speak, bribed his wife into agreeing uh, to the divorce. So you can resolve conflict often by compensating the person who is opposed to the action uh, in other ways. And we, we observe that being resolved at that time and, of course, uh, being resolved still in uh, the great increase in divorce rates since the 1970s. <coughs> From the point of view of your work, then, the, the method that's selected, the process through which this internal conflict is, re, uh, is resolved, is, is a curiosity, maybe I could say, but it's not critical to your ultimate work. Well, I wouldn't quite go that far. To the extent that the conflict greatly affects what the family does, then, of course, that is critical to my work, and I try to analyze the conflict. So but if the divorce occurs, it's the event of the divorce occurring that is what you would use, not how that was resolved. Is not that? generally the precise mechanism through which that was <coughs> resolved. Although I, we've had some studies, uh, some students and myself have done some studies on, for example, how uh, alimony payments and child support payments to divorced women varied as a result of the change in the divorce laws that began to occur in 1970 when we went to unilateral divorce. So that is, a, is an example how we did look at somehow the method used to resolve conflict. But for the most part, I think that's right. The uh, emphasis is not on the method used, it's on the results. The method used comes into play only if it interacts with the results. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Would it be your view that, um, that that's an area for future exploration? Can can economic uh, discipline be applied to uh, looking at that internal process, how families make decisions? I certainly think it can be, and it, and it should be. We still know uh, uh, depressingly little about how families function, and, uh, and with, despite all the time I've spent on it, I, I, know I, I don't know a lot more than what I do know about the behavior of families, and one of the areas I think it's interesting is look at the internal structure of families, the conflicts, the decision-making processes. I think because that will give us greater insights into some of the effects. I think as social scientists, we're mainly interested in the effects, but the, the process and the conflict can at times, and does at times, I'm sure, have an enormous uh, influence on these effects. So to look at these effects, to look at the behavior, you often have to go into the conflict. Um, I'm not uh, well read in the field, uh, so I may be wrong, but my assumption is that you were one of the leaders in in applying at least uh, economic theory to the family, and this has been fairly recent, hasn't it? I mean, 
it's a recent development. Well, the economist's interest in the families and use of economic techniques, I think, really dates uh, no more than 20 years ago. So it is recent. It is not an old tradition. Uh, Malthus was an economist, and of course the Malthusian theory of population was an effort to apply economics to the family around the beginning of the 19th century. But for the period from the late 19th century to about 1960, economists uh, basically paid almost no attention to the family. So it's, re it's been revived since 1960, and I've been one of the participants in this revival, along with a number of other economists. Yeah, do you see it expand, continuing to expand? I think there's little question in my mind that it has been expanding and will continue to do so. Uh, there is, in the last decade alone, there's been a, a sizable increase in the number of economists who are trying to look at the family, and also in a number of sociologists who are looking at the family with techniques borrowed from economists, rationality, maximization, and the usual techniques that we associate with economists are increasingly also being used by sociologists. So this, what I would prefer to call the economic approach to the family, has been growing rapidly, and I definitely anticipate that this will continue to grow during the next decade. The family is too important uh, to admit it uh, to be discussed only by uh, people from other disciplines or with other techniques. Unfortunately, economists uh, have recognized this and are getting into it now. Uh, I personally applaud it. What do you mean by the phrase human capital? You mentioned that in your opening comments. Well, by take the two words, human and capital. By capital, we usually mean some, something that is durable. You spend a fair bit of money now and you collect the benefits over a long period of time. With regard to human capital, that would be something like education. You spend a lot of money getting a college education and you hope you will capture the benefits of that education for more or less the rest of your life. Now the human component comes in to distinguish education, for example, from a machine. Education is embodied in the individual. It's part of the human being. You cannot separate the human being from his education or her education. Of course, you can separate a person from the machine uh, he owns. So the human part is the embodiment of this type of capital in the individual. And human capital therefore refers uh, to the acquisition of various skills, knowledge, by an individual that will contribute to higher productivity during the rest of his lifetime. In the uh, little bit of reading I've done of some of your material on the family, it would seem to me that those two things that you've mentioned, the family and human capital, just kind of fall together very naturally. Isn't the family almost primarily concerned about human capital? The family is certainly the, the major provider of human capital, even in modern society with the great importance of schools, because child care is uh, the, almost the exclusive uh, province of families. Families have the influence on children at, at their most crucial and impressionable ages, in the first 15 years. Uh, what they get is dominated to a large extent by what the families provide them no accident, therefore, that the achievements of children are closely related to the families they come from, and that one of the major problems facing any modern society is how we take in people who come from broken families, uncaring families, and still try to give them reasonable opportunities. That's a recognition of the crucial importance of families in providing uh, human capital, and the basis in, uh, for the uh, capacity to benefit from a college education and the like. So I think you're right on the mark. The family is the crucial provider of human capital in every society that I've ever seen any evidence on. If we think of individuals as raw material, is it correct to think of your research as concerned with uh, the process and the cost of, if you would, turning that raw material into a wealth-creating entity? Uh, is that one way of saying what you're talking about? Or? Well, that's an important part of what the analysis of human capital is devoted to. 
that how, you, as you say, you get raw material, people get born with some genetic comp uh, composition, but that's basically what they have, and they're transformed through their upbringing and their contacts and their influences, and by, mainly by the families, but by other environmental influences. They're transformed into the adults that uh, they become, and how that operates, the role of family background, the role of other opportunities is an important part uh, of the research I've been involved in. Is there any sense in which this, this process, if you would, uh, we, we often say that children are the focus of all families. If you, if you think of children as raw material, then it seems to me in a sense that, 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 that the, the relationship of the parent and the child in that evolution is it, would it be your judgment that that's probably the most important factor at work in the in the physical and social character of families? Certainly the relation between the parents and child is, is crucial in many different respects. The parent directly conveys to the children much knowledge, values, morals. So they, they clearly of great importance. Parents provide the financial resources that enable uh, their children to take advantage of various opportunities, to go on to help them through college, uh, to uh, give them other types of training, vocational training, and other skills. So both with the uh, financial outlays that parents make on their children and the direct influence of parental upbringing, parental contact with children, uh, they're an enormous influence on children. And here the economist is, is, is at one with the psychiatrists and the psychologists and the sociologists. And on that I think there's little disagreement that the family has a crucial role to play in uh, determining what happens uh, to the newborns in our society. Your studies uh, seem to suggest to me that, and this is a little different area, <coughs> that uh, one element of families and children is this whole question of population control. It seems to me your studies seem to suggest that the uh, would, that, that whole question can best be met by uh, dealing with the with somehow some effort to increase parental income and forget about all these other technical questions, providing birth control information. Let's just get the family income up. That seems to have the right result. Is that correct or not? Is it? Can I make it that well, simple? Well, maybe that's a little too simple, so let, let me elaborate on that. I may come back to it, but I'll say it in a more complicated fashion. <laughs> uh, I do think birth control knowledge is important, and I'm all for efforts to provide greater knowledge. I, uh, not a greater knowledge can hurt, and it can only help, and there may be, and there are good reasons why possibly private systems do not provide enough knowledge in many different areas. I'm in favor of uh, dissemination of birth control knowledge. Okay. The, the, question, the difficult questions with population policy is how far should we go beyond the dissemination of knowledge. And these are worldwide issues. We have the, the examples of China and India who have taken some very strong measures to try to forcibly prevent people from having ch uh, children. On the other hand, we have now some European countries who are greatly worried about that they're running out of people, or they will run out of people before long. They want to encourage people to have more children. Germany is far from reproducing itself now, and in 30 or 40 years, we'll have significant declines in population if, if the current rates of uh, birth rates continue. So the difficult and important population issues are, assuming we do provide extensive knowledge, should we interfere in any other way with uh, a family's desires uh, to have the number of children uh, they want to have. And on, on that, I wouldn't say I have uh, very strong views. In general, because I'm a skeptic in general about the efficacy of governmental interference in private decisions, I'm skeptical in this area too. For the most part, I think families, if they have the right knowledge, will make the right choices in terms of how many children they want as well as in, in other areas of their life, for the most part. Now, uh, there are all sorts of um, exceptions and, and difficulties that one may encounter with that view in, in particular instances, but for the most part, I'm not in favor of a strong policy of interfering 
with the number of children that families would like, given that we have conveyed uh, sufficient knowledge to them. And clearly, to come back to your point, family income is an important factor. It's, uh, children are costly, and so um, uh, people with insufficient income will not be able to do as well by their children as people with lower incomes. Uh, it's, uh, but income is not the whole story. There are other dimensions of family care and, uh, for children and treatment of children that uh, we, we, we have to give some attention to. So that you're not quick to embrace an argument that would say that it is to society's benefit that one have uh, children only up to the point where one can, quote, meet some society set standard of providing for them? No. In general, I'm not. Um, although I, I, I see the issues that are being addressed by, by that. I think it's dangerous when we, I think it's, it's dangerous when we begin uh, to interfere strongly in as intimate a personal decision as a judgment about how many children people should have. On the other hand, there is a difficult issue that society encounters, and we're encountering that in the United States. We have very high uh, birth rates by teenagers, unmarried teenagers, the highest in the world probably are in the United States. And this is not just uh, blacks, it's also whites. Blacks have very high illegitimacy or uh, rates, uh, rates by unmarried mothers, but so do whites by comparison with European countries. This is a real problem. Uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a special problem in part because these young people are, are generally incapable, they're not matured enough to provide their children uh, with uh, the correct upbringing. It's an additional problem because they generally do not have enough resources, so society is drawn into supporting through welfare and other devices the, uh, their children. And consequently, I think those are important issues. I think they have to be faced. I think we can improve in a number of ways the way we distribute some support through welfare in other ways to uh, unmarried mothers and the like to uh, improve the well-being of their children at the same time not encourage them uh, to have even more children than they would have in the absence of these programs. That's where I think the main social issues are how to design uh, useful programs that recognize that we do not want to permit uh, poor people uh, who do not have the means, we do not want to permit the children in these families to be the victims of the poverty that they're facing because their parents are so poor, and at the same time not design programs that mainly stimulate the, these people, poorer people, to have still more children and uh, exacerbate the problem. That, I think, is the difficult social issue. And, and it's human capital that's, that's the primary factor here, if I understand correctly. Not physical, not the fact that these uh, unmarried mothers <coughs> are unable to, quote, give their 17-year-old a bequest or put, it, it's the fact that, the, that, that in that whole developmental process of human capital, they aren't able to uh, to promote it. Is that correct? I think that's clearly the main issue. Uh, bequests in the United States are only important in about half the, half the families. So you don't have to be very poor in this country uh, to be in a situation where bequests will be small. So it's, it's not bequests, no, I know. It is the human capital. We do know that uh, children who come out of these families typically are just not as well prepared for adult life as, as children from uh, families that have provided them with more human capital. They haven't learned as much in the family, they aren't as well motivated, uh, they are values, are, are values that we would uh, generally consider not to be the best ones for them to get on in the world and the like. So it's, it's definitely 99% of the problem is human capital and 1% maybe is the physical capital side. So that intervention, whether it occurs by churches or government or some other mediating institution, in your view, should focus on that human capital question and make sure that, that the individual doesn't become, if you would, addicted to the physical handout. Uh, well, I think that is a problem that 
we want we we want to generate a uh, population of children uh, who have, have uh, we'll never be in a in a situation. Let me step back a little. We'll never be in a situation where we're going to have equal opportunity, independently of the family people come from. But I think the, a major goal of U.S. society, from the founding fathers to the present, is to try at least to mitigate as much as is po reasonably possible the handicaps that people face as a function of the backgrounds they come from. And that that I think is, is the problem here. And to try to uh, do the best we can to reduce the handicaps of people coming from poor families so they have a reasonable chance of doing well in school and doing well in life subsequently, of uh, holding a job and holding a good job and rising, of they're able, being able to rise in, in society and do uh, well. That, I think, is, it should be the goal uh, of, of these programs. And that has almost nothing to do with physical capital. It's, it's, it's essentially a problem in the acquisition of human capital by people who are coming from disadvantaged uh, households and how we can uh, partially, I say not fully, we'll never be able to fully, but partially overcome those problems. I found it very interesting that, that you made the relationship between, uh, if you would, increasing the human capital and the, the, the growth rate of our nation or even the world economy. Um, do you consider that to be a, 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 a very large factor influencing uh, growth? Well, I think human ca the growth of human capital is one of the most important factors in, understand in a country's growth. And, in, and I can cite some evidence. If you look at the United States, for example, go back to the latter part of the 19th century, people have calculated the amount spent on education relative to the amount spent on physical capital. And then they've, they, they follow that over time until the modern period. And that ratio of amount spent on education to the amount spent on investment in physical capital is about tripled over that period. So there's been an enormous growth over that period for the United States. Take a more recent example, one of the tigers of Asia, Taiwan. Taiwan has had an, uh, one of the most successful growth rates the world has ever seen from the period of 1960. Uh, what do we see about Taiwan? It's a, it's a country with almost no raw materials. It's a mountainous uh, island, highly densely populated, uh, practically no minerals uh, to mount anything. But what have they done? Well, they've done a number of useful things, but one of the things they've done is they have a highly educated population. It's grown rapidly since 1960. Not surprising, at the same time they lowered their birth rates, so each family is now having fewer children and is investing a lot more in each of their children. And I think there's little question that this has been an important factor in understanding why Taiwan has grown so much uh, and why other countries with uh, the same uh, Chinese population have done poorly. You've stated, and, and you've also quoted others, relative to the, the fact that the, that, that that few earnings advantages or disadvantages seem to survive for very long. Would you expand on that? Well, by very long, I mean over generations. And the issue that I was addressing in, in that, uh, where I've written some papers, uh, a topic of intergenerational inequality, what that fancy term means is, is, is the following. One of the things I think we're all concerned about is that while we will accept that there's inequality at any moment in time, there are poor and the rich, but as I said earlier, what we'd like to believe is that there's equality of opportunity so that children from poorer backgrounds have almost as good a chance as doing well in life as people from richer backgrounds. Now, when I say earnings inequalities don't last over generations, I mean the data suggests for the United States and for many other countries, that children coming from, who come from families where their parents earn a lot will not earn that much more than the average person. And children who come from families where their poor parents are rather poor will not earn that much less than the average person. So in two generations, you pretty much eliminate all the background effects on earnings. And in three generations, you essentially eliminate it all. 
There's an old saying in the Western world that from shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. So your grandparents start out in shirt sleeves, relatively poor, the parents rise, and the grandchildren are down once again. I think that more or less um, uh, uh, typifies what we see now in the United States and uh, in many other countries, that uh, there's not that much inequality that persists across generations. And that includes poverty as well as rich. The uh, children of the poor, and I include children from um, uh, poor of all races, uh, tend to do much better than their parents. So therefore, it would seem to me that the government's effort at redistributing wealth is like trying to get water to stand in a column. It, I mean, as rapidly as you pour water out of the bucket, it's not going to stay there. It, it's like this thing that's going to, any, any wisdom you apply to it because of this other factor is, go, is going to get you nowhere. Well, but we, ha we have to be a little careful. We have to recognize that part of the reason, I don't know how big a part, but part of the reason for this, uh, th this lack of maintenance of inequality is uh, government support of education and some other human capital institutions. So it's possible now for children from poorer families to get a free college education or a much, much cheaper one and so on for graduate education. So that contributes to this. Is, is that the decisive factor? I think probably not, but I also think it is a contributing factor. So I would stress rather that the real place where the emphasis of government should be would be on providing equal access to investments in human capital. That should be the device used uh, to improve the functioning of the system. And as a byproduct, it will uh, raise the uh, uh, equality of opportunity and make the persistence of poverty or wealth across generations even lower than it is. Is there uh, generation fighting? Do, do you think of uh, grandparents and children as competing economically? Well, there are a number of different areas where that question arises. One is in the political arena, which has arisen most uh, recently. It's been claimed that one reason we've observed the great growth in Social Security in the United States that we have seen since the 1970s is that increased government expenditures on the old have been partly at the expense of government expenditures on the young. Now, there's no question that the rate of growth of expenditures on the old in the United States and in Western Europe has been uh, rapid and enormous. But what most people are not aware of is that there's been a similar growth in expenditures on the young. So some calculations I made show that from 1950 to the mid-1980s, the ratio of expenditures per young person by, the, by all levels of government in the United States, the ratio of expenditures on each young person to expenditures on each person over 65 has remained about the same. So in that sense, uh, the success of the old in getting more of the government's money has not been at the expense of the young. There's no question there is some potential and has been conflict between the two, particularly at these times of limited government budgets and, more, and concern about uh, increasing government expenditures. But up until now, the success of old people in getting greater, quote, handouts from the government have not been at the expense of the, um, of the young. What do you see on the family level there? Is, is there any evidence that, that uh, altruism isn't always motivating grandparents relative to children or grandchildren? Rather? Well, it doesn't always motivate, but I think altruism is important. On the other hand, there, there's always been a problem in most societies of how does one uh, handle the needs of the old. Uh, the old people can accumulate resources and so on, but suppose they get, get iller than they expected, or they have other problems. Who comes to their rescue or their help? Traditional societies, it's usually children and possibly grandchildren. Usually children help out the old. They, the old live with their children and so on. And each of these societies has developed the mechanisms by which children are induced to do it, partly out of altruism, partly also because of great pressures within local communities that, so to speak, force the children to take care of their old, otherwise they're ostracized. Those pressures have been lost in a modern world. We're a much more mobile society. We don't tend to live together. We're in big, anonymous cities and the like. And therefore, modern societies face a somewhat different problem 
of how, well, how, what kind of mechanisms can we have to provide the support for the old. Now, possibly we could have devised policies by which children will do it on their own. The route we've taken, however, is to have the government step in and handle a much bigger part of the burden. Well, since the government is doing it, there's less need for the children to do it. And what may appear to be now callous children who don't do much for their parents or grandchildren may simply be that they're responding to the fact, well, they know their, their elderly uh, parents are being taken care of by the government with Medicare, Medicaid, and uh, Social Security payments and the like. And therefore, they don't show as much concern. But it's rational in part, at least, and in good part for them to show much less concern given the uh, great intrusion of the government into these areas. Would you say that it's reasonable then to say that the family has benefited from the growth of government? Well, that, that's a much more complicated question. I think it has benefited in some ways, but it's also been hurt in some ways because, because it takes Social Security. Of course, people get payments, the family gets payments, but the family is also paying. I mean, there, there's no sugar daddy out there yeah. <laughs> who's paying these taxes. So if the old are getting uh, these uh, payments, the young are paying. So to speak, the children are paying indirectly for their parents through taxation. Is that a better method of doing it than otherwise? If children were willing to do it voluntarily, no. I think it's a better method to have children do it. I would prefer if Social Security only helped out in those situations when elderly people had no other means, no access to other means for their support. I think that would be a more efficient, a, a, a fairer, and a better a society. So I wouldn't want to conclude that uh, the family uh, in all ways has benefited from this great growth of government. It's both benefited and hurt. There's no question, however, it's been a greatly affected by the growth of government. It's response to this growth. And um, that's something we can clearly uh, see and understand, the benefit-cost calculation is a more difficult one. Well, we've spent most of our time talking about the family, which uh, is something I found very interesting in your work. Uh, but let me change direction because you've done an awful lot of other work. And uh, let me throw out a question that we couldn't resolve if we talked for another two hours, but I'll ask it anyway. <laughs> is government growth inevitable in a democracy? Well, maybe we should stop with your statement that we can't resolve that one. <laughs> it, is a, it is a question you've looked at. Though. Yes, I have looked at it. Now, it, it depends on what we mean by the inevitable. Uh, uh, we observe, we look at governments in the last 80 years in democracies, they've certainly grown. As a positive social scientist, um, that makes me convinced that there are strong forces leading to the growth of government in such society. So my own feeling would be it's inevitable in the sense I do not anticipate that as long as, let's say, we have maintained democracies here and in other parts of the world, that we will get any sharp uh, turnabout toward reduced government involvement in society. Well, it seems to me that, that one of the things that you've, you've implied is that I would be better off to go out and try to capture some of this government handout rather than go out and engage in a taxpayer's revolt. Is that an accurate reflection of your, your research? Well, there are different ways that one can uh, respond to the uh, fact that governments are important. One is that we try to organize ourselves into groups and we try to get more support from the government. So that clearly is in people's self-interest. And that's why we college professors get a lot of handouts, if you, if you use your word. <laughs> sure. I'm just using your word. That's right. I understand. <laughs> we get a lot of handouts from the government along with everybody, uh, practically every other group in society. We do. And it's certainly, I consider, perfectly rational for college professors to try to get these handouts where everybody else is, even though I personally believe that a lot of these handouts to professors and everybody else uh, should be reduced. But that is a good way to go. But at the same time, we can also try to uh, be active in reducing taxes. Those two have been successful. I have a small cottage, summer cottage, in the state of Massachusetts, which at one time was one of the big taxing states. 
A few years ago, taxpayers got better organized in that taxing state. They put in a property tax control, a 2.5% rule. And my property taxes in this cottage I have on Cape Cod have hardly gone up in the last seven or eight years. Well, in Chicago, they've gone up enormously where I own a home. Mm -hmm. So I think taxpayers can be successful. But they're being up against the success of various pressure groups. And I do not believe that the success of taxpayers will ever be such to greatly cut back in, in the next decade or so, that's as far as my crystal wall goes, uh, greatly cut back the role of government in society. Your comment about Cape Cod, I've been reading that Nantucket, the selectmen are having trouble because of the tax limitation. So it does have some effect. Uh, let me read a quote from Leonard Reed. Uh, in a little book he wrote called Talking to Myself, you're, I'm sure, familiar with it. Um, and he, he said the following, were that uh, cheers are signals, uh, is, is the point here. He said, we're heading toward whatever is cheered. By the cheering, I mean to include what is approved, what is bought, what is listened to, what is read, what is worshipped, what commands our pride. End of the quote. Where do you think we're headed? What's all the cheering tell us about where we're headed in the United States? Well, we're, we're headed in a number of different directions, depending upon what we want to emphasize. If we look, say, at the role of government, I believe, in spite of the talk about the conservative revolution, Reagan and his influence, and there's no question there's been an influence, there's no evidence to me whatsoever that we have changed the pressures toward a large and a growing government in, say, the United States. They're still there. Uh, the Reagan administration has had, I think, some great successes, but it has not reversed that. In fact, total government spending has been moving along quite merrily and will continue to move along. And that's because of the issue we uh, discussed earlier, the power of individual pressure groups who can concentrate the benefits on themselves and spread the costs among many, many taxpayers, each taxpayer not worrying so much that they happen to be supporting college professors a bit or supporting postmen a bit or supporting uh, uh, health expenditures a great deal, uh, but these pressure groups uh, do benefit enormously from that support. So I don't think, I think the cheers are toward continuing government support. On the family, uh, uh, to, if I can close on that issue, I believe the family is going to continue to be the strong institution for most people in our society. We're not going to go back to the old-fashioned family with four or five children, with close interaction with cousins and grandparents and the like. It's going to be the nuclear family a small family, uh, but it's going to be a strong family. And again, in crises, people will frequently look to their siblings, their children, or their parents for support and not to others. So the family will uh, maintain itself strongly. It will respond to whatever changes occur in the future, but the cheers will still be to maintain this family and uh, it will just evolve as events evolve.